we all know the butlers uh, were very, very important to have in, in the county, and I think tonight our large audience reflects um, the interest in the family. And um, John has written, I'm sure you've seen it as well, a very, very impressive book on the butlers, and uh, he will tell you where it is available should anybody want to purchase a copy. But uh, without any further ado, I welcome John. Is that okay? Yeah. Yes. I gave this last week to the IGS, so it took me 55 minutes. Uh, and that's good, we're a good gallery. So we'll, we'll start. And I'm sure you all know lots about poetry. So largely I'm relying on, on images such as portraits and artifacts to tell the story and uh, to give some idea of the um, importance and the splendor of the family at various periods during their seven or eight hundred year history. This is a view, this is a, um, a, a picture which came to life about 18 months ago in uh, a local auction in Kenny. It shows the castle in a kind of romantic vein from about 1830 by Henry O'Neill, who has recently been rediscovered by Dr. Peter Harbison. So it was a very interesting and lovely to see this image. Uh, you all know uh, the origins of the, of the butlers. They were a part of the uh, Norman invasion of Ireland in 1169, uh, led by Strongbow Earl of Clare, who built the castle at Kilkenny. And this is just a, 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 an almost contemporary representation of, of the Ireland. Uh, of and then this is a slightly later view of Daryl and Maura Cameron, who invited, as you know, the Normans into Ireland uh, to help him regain the, uh, the kingship of Leinster. And then um, you are probably all familiar with elements of this heraldic shield. It's the it's the it's the key the key um, armorial bearings of the family. It shows the chief indented in the top. Uh, left hand corner with the three covered cups representing the uh, the office of Chief Herald of Ireland, which they which they um, which they were granted by uh, Prince John around 1199. Uh, and they received early on they received grants of land at Arklow and one of the early things they got was the presage of why which gave them um, a twenty percent no is it ten percent of uh, of a tax on each ton, T U N N, of wine which was landed in Ireland. Of course, it wasn't always possible for the Ormans to collect this money, and very often people like the Earls of Desmond um, didn't pay up. And uh, in many courts in, say, the west of Ireland, they had no, uh, they had no power to implement the collection. So it only, it only really came into force in the paid areas, Kilkenny and Tipperary. And then later on, when things settled down during the time of the great Duke and his successors. Um, one of the reasons why the, um, why the Butlers came to prominence, uh, one of their kinsmen, one of, one of the brother of the first team of all, Hubert Bolter, uh, was our official of Canterbury. And here he's shown uh, anointing uh, King John in 1199. This is the contemporary image of that. Um, to, to give you just some idea of the spread of the omens of the Bosses, this is Lord Dunboyne's uh, chart of the family, showing the main descendants today. And here we have the omen line, and the last lady mark was died in 1997, uh, age 98. He was the, he was the English born uh, Charles Butler, but he had spent most of his working life uh, living in the Chicago area of uh, the USA, and when he died, he left two daughters, so the Marcus became extinct. And, but the Arabs of Ormond and Austria, and the chief butlership, is still very much alive, and the current uh, Lord Mount Garrett, who is the 18th Viscount Mount Garrett, uh, is the senior, senior loan claimant, and he's in the process of, of, uh, of forwarding his claim uh, with the College of Herons in London. Of course, the Queen uh, is descended uh, through her mother uh, from the great Duke, uh, from the great Duke's uh, second daughter, Lady Elizabeth, uh, Lady Elizabeth Butler, who became Countess of Chesterfield. 
So you see the other heads of, of junior houses, Sir Thomas Butler, but his son Sir Richard is the, is the uh, current representative of that branch. He lives in County Carlow, but the Queen, uh, I'm not sure who is the present representative of Baroness Lucas. The Mount Garrett branch are still going. Brian the Earl of Cali from Mount Julius are still going. And of course, Don Moy is now the, uh, the, the present head of the House of Don Moy is now Richard Don Moy, who is the 30th Lord Don Moy. And that's just a, a quick look at the, uh, the, the other side. Is this the next one? Is that John? Yes, I just brought that's the. Uh, that's the lady who is the plot for Council Chesterfield, from who, who is the ancestress uh, of the current Queen. Um, and uh, it's true hard that the Queen has Irish and Butler blood. The first Earl is James Butler, and he was created Earl by Edward III in 1327 uh, 28. Um, uh, these effigies survive at Gordon, uh, which is a, a small village in County Kenny. Uh, known for its grace course, Golden Park. And these were in the ruined uh, pre-Reformation parish church, but they're now uh, in, the, uh, in the area of that church, which was later the Church of Ireland Church. So it's part of a, of a little museum or a little collection of memorial slabs, which have been conserved largely by the OPW. So these are early, 30, are early 14th century. It's believed they are the first Ireland captives. And I'll give you there some information about the first countess. She was elderly to go and she was a granddaughter of um, Edward I. So it was a very uh, important marriage. And one of the reasons why James Butler was made early, why he got uh, grants and lands, and also um, enjoyed many other favours at this period. And this is just a representation of Edward II, who will be the first cousin of, uh, of the first countess. And uh, it just shows you a little view of contemporary life at that time. And here is another uh, document. It's the Bowman Psalter of 1370, 1390. Evidence of the wealth and standing of the family who intermarried with the old Durrells. And here also is a, a, a miniature, which is believed to be a contemporary view of the old Owen, but the first, the first count of the Owen is a little bit distorted. And the Psalter was actually owned by a, a brother of the camp, first Countess of Ormond. And then we move on, uh, this is just a view from the uh, 1390s. Uh, the first four Earls were all key uh, figures in the, in the pay or in the administration of the, uh, of the English government in Ireland. The first, second, third and fourth Earls all were, were either Lord Lieutenants or Lord Deputies uh, at various stages. And so there were key figures in the implementation of the, of the uh, English jurisdiction, for want of a better word, in Ireland, especially in the Pale, Tipperary, and in, in, in parts of Munster. But of course, they were always up against the Earls of Desmond, with whom they had various uh, fractious disagreements at times. Um, and the last uh, open conflict between them was in 1565 with the Battle of Ophain when Black Tom, the 10th Earl of Ormond, uh, defeated uh, his, his mother's second husband, Gerard, the 15th Earl of Desmond. And at this stage, uh, later on, after the death of the 4th Earl, the 5th, 6th and 7th Earl were largely absentee and were involved, not so much here in Ireland, but in England, where they were uh, also uh, well-to-do uh, landowners, and the fifth Earl was also created Earl of Wiltshire. Uh, he lost his head. He was on the Lancastrian side of the Wars of Roses, and he lost his head after the Battle of Talbot in 1461. So they were heavily involved in English politics at uh, that time. That is from the fifth, sixth, and seventh Earls. And they were all at various stages attained and had their property uh, forfeit. But the seventh Earl uh, regained uh, the, the favour of Henry the Seventh, the first Tudor king, and he ended up being Chamberlain for um, uh, no other no person than Catherine of Aragon, the first queen of Henry the Eighth. And when he died in 1515, he held that post, as well as owning 72 manors in England, uh, which were largely left to his two daughters. Uh, one became a, a Saint Ledger or a Salinger. And the other one was married to a Boleyn. And we know, we all, you all know the connection between the Butlers and the Boleyns. 
There was another connection in that J was the, um, what's going on here? Uh, and there was another connection um, uh, between James Butler, the uniter of the moment, in that in around the 1520s, when he was at court, it was proposed that uh, he should be, uh, he was proposed as a husband for Anne Boleyn prior to her entanglement with, uh, with Henry VIII. And of course, that's Anne Boleyn, uh, a miniature. And this is a portrait by Holbein, and, we, and I believe it's from 1537 when the Earl was at court and was, was in attendance upon the infant uh, Prince Edward, who later became Edward VI at his christening, in which he played a noted figure and held, uh, held uh, some of the claws and uh, I think some of the uh, prisoners that were used to baptize the, uh, the Tudor heir. This um, is his father, the only representation we have. And after the ambush, have a mad rush south. I mean, you know the geography of where we're talking about. I mean, we go north, east, south, west, basically, and they go south, towards Fleet, Lamont, and the Galatians. I'm talking about Tracy Green and Hogan, and the others went to uh, different places. Some of them went home. Now, this is January, remember, and so, you know, it's, it's moving on, 12, 1 o'clock. Um, the light is fading, it's cold weather, the weather has been very bad, it's very cold, it's very snowy. Um, in Breen's own book, I mean, he describes aspects of this flight because it is very dramatic. Um, the weather's very cold, it begins to snow, which of course leaves tracks. And then these are quotations in the book. We headed southeast towards the Galatee Mountains. The wind was piercingly cold, several times we lost our way. At one point, Sean Tracy fell into a ravine about 20 feet deep. Now, the book suggests, you know, most people, I think, when they read books, they don't kind of read it forensically, but if you really examine how these things are put, there's a suggestion that they made it to some of Gauti Moore. I can't imagine that they did and, and retraced their steps. Now, it's different if I was giving this talk in Donegal and you didn't know the territory, but I, mean, you, I don't have to paint a picture for you. You know, it's, it's bad weather in January and you're, you're heading up the Gauti's. It doesn't it's really bad. So, really, what happened only makes sense if it's understood as panic. In other words, an intention to steal ends in people being killed. Now, which is not, as I said, the later Green version. Now, the inquest was held in temporary military barracks on the following day with a jury of 12 local men and the county inspector, the district inspector present, fairly standard, but, you know, given two policemen, the deputy commissioner from headquarters in Dublin came down. Um, Obviously, I haven't time, we can't here go through the full text of, 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 the, of the inquest, just some of the key moments from it. Um, there's a reference to a Dennis Ryan in this, and he's the chap who owned the quarry and so on, live nearby. The two witnesses on whom most attention focused, I mean, you know, that's all they had. The <coughs> our, our IRA chaps were gone, <coughs> the two policemen were dead, so you're left with um, the county council worker and somebody who, who's, who's a contracted worker, essentially, the guy who owns the cart. And, um, you know, this isn't what they signed up for, so they're, they're in pretty much a state. Um, they're kept in the barracks. And Flynn, of course, collapses and is taken to hospital, and it's all very dramatic. And clearly, he's, he's, he's not at all comfortable with the questions being asked. Um, the RIC wasn't in any doubt as to who the leadership of, I mean, they may not have known exactly everybody who was involved, um, but it's the old absent from home thing. And given the record that people like Tracy and so on had, there wasn't it. And doubt, hence the, the kidnapping of their relations, and the children, which is in, in the book, I'm not going into it here. Um, but there isn't any doubt as to who they were looking for. Um, the people who mattered, of course, would be Robinson, Tracy, Brain, and Crow. And the first witness at the inquest was Patrick Flynn, um, who was the county council worker. I live in a van at Solid Bay Quarry. I called with a horse and cart to the military barracks at around 10 a.m.